Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to be talking about our next unit, and we're going to start with our, an intro to mannerism. So we only have one slash two works that are described as mannerist. Mannerism is also kind of thought of as the late Renaissance. So the IDs are listed here, and most of our unit will be about Baroque and also New Spain. What's interesting about Il Gisu is, first of all, we'll talk about some of it today and some of it tomorrow. But Il Gisu has a mannerist facade, but it's a Baroque church with Baroque uh, fresco, ceiling fresco. So you might notice that we have one artist for the, uh, the architect, the plan of the church, one that does the facade, and then one that does the fresco. And same thing, we have dates and materials associated with that. So if I were you, I would focus on just one of those. Uh, I think you would be totally fine to say any one on the, um, the exam. All right, let's dive in. So framing the units, um, first of all, we study this time period and those coming up chronologically first. So if you think about, we studied 13th century Gothic, 14th, 15th Renaissance, and now in the 16th, 17th century, Baroque is what we're looking at. Um, and it varies by region, so that's another thing to consider. When we talk about the modern world, we're talking about Western Europe, so modern Atlantic world, so on the sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Western Europe is usually associated with these countries, and a lot of times we use Western Europe as this focal point, and a big part of that is, yes, the artwork and the literature that comes from that time is really impressive, but it also has to do with the documentation. There was a lot of documentation of art and literature at the time, both at the time period and then in centuries since, it's been such a focus that so much study has gone into it. We also have to remember that museums and books have really preserved works from this time period, so we haven't lost a lot to um, the elements out in the environment. We haven't lost a lot to, um, you know, the cultural groups destroying their works or not taking care of them in the home. So a lot has been preserved. And so that's why it's one of our focuses. We're also going to look at Spanish empire territories. Um, and in this case, all of these countries that are considered part of the Spanish empire during the 16th century, um, we're going to call new Spain just because it's an extension of Spain uh, that they're making in the new world. All right. And then the last one, there, traditional old world narrative. So the way many people study survey one and survey two in art history, they study it in a way that like Europe comes first and then it all trickles out to other places around the world. And so what that narrative does is it privileges Europe and marginalizes other areas of the world. And so it's complex because it's true in a lot of ways that certain things started in Europe and then they moved to other places. But it's also true that other places have their own artwork and their own style and their own context, and then Europe's kind of fused with that. So just to be mindful as you're thinking about it, that the way you phrase, the way that we order things can give you an idea of um, a certain narrative about privilege. And so it's just something I like to point out. And that's why the timeline that I gave you to the right talks about a lot of different things happening in a lot of different places of the world, just so that you have a frame that all of these things are happening at once. It's not Europe, 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 and then boom to the new world. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but what's interesting to me, I'll point out a couple. 1300, Giotto's painting his frescoes in the Arena Chapel. And then 1325, this is when the Mexica are founding Tenochtitlan. If you remember the capital city that we looked at um, in the Temple Mayor. So they're just founding their home at that point. And then back in Europe, 1340s, we have a plague wiping out a lot of Europe. In 1453, we have Constantinople falling to the Turks. 1450, Gutenberg is inventing the printing press, movable type. And then in 1492, Columbus goes to the New World. We have the Protestant Reformation shortly after that. 1517, 1519, Spain conquers the Aztecs. And then in the 16th century, that's when Spain starts their settlements. And then continuing down through, we'll get to some of the other pieces. All right, so just to recap, we already looked at 
the last judgment scene in the back of the Sistine Chapel and described it as mannerism. So when we look at one of the panels from the ceiling and we compare it off to the side, um, you can see a big difference in the style. We see the forms in the body are really exaggerated, sometimes in a not realistic way. We also see deeper shadows, so making things a little bit more complex to understand. Right In the past, Last Judgment images of Christ, he'd have one hand up, one hand down, so it was very clear, heaven or hell. In this case, his hands are a little bit more confusing in their positioning. All right, so we're going to watch a quick video on mannerism to help clarify. When you first look at a mannerist painting, you might be tempted to think that it's a product of the Italian Renaissance. And you'd be right. Sort of. Mannerism is a period of art that came out of the High Renaissance in Italy, and it's also known as the Late Renaissance period. It lasted from about 1520 to 1580. The influence of the Renaissance style is clear in the paintings of the Mannerist movement. There are figures from religion and mythology, rich colors and careful details, all of which you would expect from the art of this age. But when you look again, you discover that something's a little off. Upon closer inspection, you realize that the figures are distorted. No one's neck is that long. No human can maintain that distorted pose. No one's skin is that bright. The lines are kind of exaggerated, aren't they? And the geographical setting is unclear. The space is strange. That's when you realize this isn't Renaissance art. This is mannerism. The mannerists knew what they were doing when they created these slightly odd images and presented them as genuine. Distorting elements such as scale and perspective, adding drama in subtle ways whenever they could, were exactly the look they were going for. The name mannerism comes directly from the first known art historian, Giorgio Vasari. Giorgio himself was a mannerist artist and used the Italian term maniera, meaning style, in his encyclopedia to describe the period in which he worked. Many art historians believe that the Mannerists were making commentary on the manners or style or proper art, proper anatomy, and even proper Christian virtue. Mannerists took cues from the Renaissance artists about matters such as bright color, fine detail, and a focus on individualism and the human form, but applied these ideas in a way that transformed their style. Mannerist artists departed from the ideals of mathematical, anatomical, spatial, and even scenic perfection of the Renaissance. In breaking these rules and depicting unrealistic body proportions, poses, colors, and settings, they opened imaginative possibilities for juxtaposed scenes, vibrant color, and perfect elegance. Mannerist paintings are often filled with tension. Rather than depicting an important scene or action, they frequently show the moment just before the action takes place. Consider Tintoretto and his painting of the Last Supper. Depicted from almost an offstage viewpoint, it is his painting of the Last Supper. Depicted from almost an offstage viewpoint, it is darker and more fraught with suspense than Da Vinci's more famous painting of the same scene. The lighting is more harsh and surreal. There are more figures off to the side, and distorted poses and elongated angels watch from up above, all distinctly mannerist characteristics. Raphael and Michelangelo, well-known painters of the Italian Renaissance, were also among the first artists to experiment with painting in a mannerist style. Francesco Mazzola, more commonly known as Parmigiano, followed these Renaissance heroes' example and became one of the first characteristically mannerist painters. Parmigiano's self-portrait in a convex mirror shows the artist painting his own distorted figure. The painting Entombment by Jacopo Pontormo features an unnaturally elongated Christ and surrounding figures bent and posed uncomfortably. Unlike many Renaissance paintings, Entombment is not didactic, with a specific dogmatic message in mind, but invites contemplation and opens itself up to interpretation. Baptism of Christ. Alright. So, we're going to talk about some of this a little bit later on, 
but you have this on your enduring understanding sheet. Remember, we only have the one and a half works that we're talking about with mannerism, um, but some of the function and stylistic things are listed here. Um, mainly, we've got this deliberately intellectual idea, so the pieces aren't as clear about which biblical scene it is. Instead, they want you to be able to think about it um, and have some uh, unclear elements so that you have to kind of fill in the blanks with your own thoughts. A lot of complicated elements that are less than perfect, not because they're not capable of it, but because they're utilizing the imperfection to uh, do different effects. And this is a response to classical high renaissance where everything was balanced and ordered, everything was thought out, mathematically, scientifically figured out to be really perfect, and now there's this focus on beauty and emotion over that order and balance. Some of the things that we'll talk about related to history, we already went over the Protestant Reformation in 1517. At that point, it kind of opens up the world of Christianity in Europe to try and figure out what do we really want to say? What do we really want to do as far as like all of the preachings from the Bible, from the church in the Catholic areas of Europe and the Protestant areas? We also have Rome being sacked by Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, in 1527. And then shortly after that happens, we have the Council of Trent or the Counter Reformation, so coming together to try to bring people back to Catholicism. And this new order of priests, the Jesuits, comes out to try to work on converting people and bringing them back to Catholic belief. All right, so let's talk about the style a little bit when we talk about mannerism. Vague, unclear settings, making it look artificial. So if we look at this piece, we definitely see a setting, but it's not really clear what's going on. Same thing here. We have curtains, but we also have a column with nothing. Is it inside? Is it outside? We have long neck, necks and distorted figures. So if you think about the length of these people, their heads seem very small and their figures are really unclear. They're in so much draping that we can't really understand the shape of their body. And it's a focus on the moment just before. So we don't exactly know what is going to happen in this scene. We can kind of predict what's going to happen, but we don't have the actual moment. And the audience would be the wealthy, educated class. These are images that uh, all of the people would be very familiar with biblical stories and the way they're usually represented. And so this is a chance to do something different that still uh, acknowledges and relates to a lot of those stories, but they're less clear about the content. All right. And so if we look at this piece, he mentioned a couple things in the picture but take a second to think about what you see that tells us that it's mannerist in terms of the content and the form and the style. Talk amongst your, your group mates. All right, so coming back together, some of the things that we see here in terms of the style and the form, the composition is kind of wedged into this tall, curved shape, but we have a lot of unclear parts of the composition. For instance, we have just like a single cloud off to the side. The center of the composition, which would typically be like a focal point, if we think of high renaissance. In this case, we just have a series of hands. It's kind of a blank space in the center of the composition. We also have people that are turned away from us, so very confusing as far as the positioning um, and exactly what's going on. We do have Mary, and we have Christ, okay? But we also have, um, you know, this person here who's supposed to be carrying the bulk of his weight, but look at how he's standing just on his tiptoes. It wouldn't make sense to be in that position and be able to hold the weight the other person holding his weight is also on his tiptoes. And the feet are very small, the heads are small, so proportionally it's pretty awkward. We also have characters like John the Baptist just kind of thrown in off to the side. And we have this kind of big sheet area that's kind of unclear exactly. Is this coming from Christ? It's just not really too clear exactly what's going on. And so the content, it's called Entombment of Christ, but we don't see a cross. 
We also don't see a tomb for him, so it's a little unclear what the content is. We know that Jesus is dead. You can tell from the skin tone and the way that he's being held in his face, but we don't exactly have the clarity that we've had in other images about um, the meaning and the feeling of each of the characters. Okay, so we have lots of bright colors, kind of push and pull you around the composition. We also have a lot of zigzags. So you might be drawn to Christ first and then drawn up to Mary. You might be drawn down because of the bright colors to some of these other characters. So it's not the pyramidal composition that's ordered. Now all of a sudden there's all of these confusing lines drawing you through the space. The figures are elongated, not anatomically correct, contorted, and their emotions aren't super clear either. If we think about Mary, in the past we've seen like either a very calm Mary, we've seen a very sad Mary, and now her, her emotion is a little bit more confusing exactly what she's feeling. We can tell there's an intense emotion, but the exact emotion is a little unclear. Okay, content. Once again, I said it's unclear. Possibly entombment, possibly crucifixion, right? We do see a little mark to show that he was on the cross, but we don't see an actual cross to tell us what's going on. And we don't know, is this, right? we can assume it's outside because of that cloud, but it's really not clear what's going on. Um, there's also a thought that Pontormo modeled himself into the piece. Um, not to say that he's in the character or is in this story, but a lot of times artists would do this. We've seen this in other places. Okay. All right, so to go into context a little bit, so at this time, there's a lot of tensions around Christianity and Catholicism versus Protestantism and all of the different sects that are kind of like birth, bursting out at this point. So um, we had the Protestant Reformation, and now all of a sudden there's a lot of dissent within the Catholic Church. A lot of people are unsure if they align with Catholic ideology. And so they're either leaving the church or they're questioning it from within. So this is something we have a lot of separation of the classes. Um, the Catholic Church is extremely wealthy. And so all of a sudden, there's a lot of um, more common people that are starting to say, hmm, I don't know if I align with the theology of the Catholic Church. So they're kind of questioning. Um, and also styles change for artists as a collective. So we saw the High Renaissance. That was kind of the general goal of all the artists previously. And now all of a sudden artists are responding to this tension around the area of Europe, around Christian ideas, Catholicism versus Protestantism. And so they're starting to shift some of their styles according to the things happening around them. And they kind of do this as a collective. They kind of compete with one another to find the new style. Functionally, this would be for a chapel. It's in the chapel it was made for. Um, so it's a religious context. And here's a picture of me at the chapel. It's behind this gate right when you walk in. There's a couple pieces by Pontormo right at the center. And the audience would be the elite. We already talked about that. Not to educate. It's not clear. Uh, what the story is. So it'd be more for people who already know the stories of Christ. And just a couple more close-ups for you. All right, let's talk about architecture and mannerism. So we're going to compare it to the Pazzi Chapel, which we already looked at, which is really a clear work of Renaissance architecture. We've got stability and order, influences from Greek and Rome. If you remember, we have the numbers 12 and 4 are repeated throughout. Uh, a lot of repetition of shape, all the circles throughout the place kind of tie it together. There's a lot of symmetry. Everything's centered right around that curved shape. Okay. When we talk about mannerism, I know this is a little blurry, but we're talking about taking all of the references from the past and kind of playing with them a little bit, mashing them up to make a new language, a new vocabulary. So in this case, we have both uses of curved arches, and then we also have the triangular pediment shape, right? And then we have columns that are close together, columns that are far apart. So it's taking all of those references we've seen before and kind of playing with them in a new way so it's unexpected. Same thing here. We have things like two columns together, split apart two columns, so it's more rhythmic. We also have the curve, triangular curve. So it's kind of creating a, a 
more complex vocabulary. All right, so we're going to talk about il gisu a little bit. Remember, today we're talking about the facade, so the exterior and the front. Uh, and there's me, just to show you the scale. This is very big. Um, and the exterior was done 100 years prior to the ceiling fresco. The church was done uh, at the beginning, right, or at least started, and then the facade was started, and then 100 years later that ceiling fresco is added. So the facade is Mannerist, and then we talk about the church and the ceiling fresco as this like more broad Baroque style. Um, we'll also talk about context of it today, and then tomorrow we'll move into the church form and the ceiling fresco content and form. All right, so form and style. What do we see that makes this Mannerist in style? I'm going to take you or give you a couple minutes to just talk about the things that you see that reference things from the past but are put together in a new way. All right, so let's come back together. <clears throat> so what we see here is a mix of pilasters. Remember those flattened columns and then engaged columns, right? We have small architectural elements within larger ones and even smaller. So we have this kind of rhythmic creation of the piece. We have Corinthian, cap Corinthian capitals, so very, very decorative and ornate, and then very austere plain pilasters off to the side. We have a mix of the triangular and the curved arches incorporated within, so it also creates this rhythmic move throughout it. So it's kind of mixing and mashing lots of different elements together. And a little, little bit more about the facade. A lot of facades of churches in Italy, the facade makes the place look more grand than it is. I don't think I have a picture of this in here, but a lot of times this whole top area, or at least a little bit of it, it's not an actual part of the church. So if you walk around from the side or the back, you just see this like extra piece standing up. So it's almost like a, a fake set to make it look bigger and more grand than it is. And function for this piece, it's the first and main Jesuit church in Rome. It is huge. And the whole point of that is to try to bring people back to the Catholic church. Okay, so just some close-ups again on these different architectural elements. So you can see, I think we talked about them. Look at even how the pediment is broken into these spaces to kind of break up um, that flat surface. All right, so a little bit of content about this piece. So I know we talked about it at the beginning, but to go into it a little bit more, the Council of Trent is this religious group under the Catholic Church. It's a group of people that come together to start coming up with what are they going to do about the uh, Protestant Reformation, about the dogma, the ideology of the Catholic Church, and um, how it's being perceived in the world. So their mission is to discuss and make decisions about beliefs, policies, and imagery. And one of the big questions is how should religious text, religious um, art, how should it be stylized and for what purpose? So if we go back to what we studied during the medieval period about icons and how they were so controversial, and so people in some areas really preferred the icon, in others they thought it was uh, very sacrilegious and not good to be worshiping an icon, that same argument and debate is becoming an issue here between Protestants and Catholics. And so um, the Council of Trent is assembled to try to make decisions about interpretations and beliefs within the church. The Counter-Reformation, 
So this is the Catholics coming back and responding to the Protestant Reformation. And at the time, the Protestants are iconoclasts. They're destroying a lot of religious imagery in Northern Europe. They're feeling like people are too connected to the artwork that seems too real. The artworks, the people look real. The religious uh, people in the pictures look too real. And so they're destroying a lot of art. And so Catholics and the Catholic Church are like, what are we going to do? We have to make sure that the artwork's protected. And we have to make it clear to the public that um, these religious characters are not icons. They're not being inappropriately worshipped. Instead, they're to teach stories. And so the Jesuit order uh, is formed kind of related to this. And so they are priests working for the Catholic Church. And they educate. So their goal is to educate and teach. And they're also missionaries. So they go out into the world traveling, spreading Catholic beliefs, doing good works. So to basically work for the church from afar um, to spread Catholicism. Okay, and so all of these things are kind of tied into this work because it is a Jesuit uh, church. And if you think about the time period, they are trying to bring a lot of people back to the Catholic church. And so they make this large scale church to accommodate a lot of people. And the imagery inside of it, especially with the ceiling fresco that we'll look at tomorrow, is really a way to bring people back to Catholic belief. And it's really engaging and enticing. And so it's, it's a way that it's related to this context. So tomorrow in class, we're going to talk about Baroque art, introducing it. Um, and we're going to spend the last few minutes in class, well, we just have quite a few left, but watching a video to introduce Baroque art. And what I'd like for you to do is record some of the style elements that they discuss so you have a good impression of what Baroque art is. Baroque is the most confusing um, and broad category of art. So we'll look at Italian Baroque, and then it'll talk about um, French and Northern Baroque a little bit, so you get like an idea of how it varies depending on the region. And where you can record these style elements, I would either do it on a separate piece of paper or in your notebook. It's good like um, general um, information, or you can go to your Enduring Understanding sheet that you got, um, and you can start recording it right on there. Um, Okay, so that's, we're going to watch that. And then if you end up having time after the video, you can prep your notebook for the future ones or check Schoology for your homework for the week. All right, so remember you're looking at stylistic elements of Baroque, and they're going to start with Italian. How can you look at a painting or sculpture and know that it was made during the period that we call the Baroque? How do you recognize the Baroque style? Let's start by looking at this very important sculpture by Bernini of the biblical story of David who defeats the giant Goliath. I'm standing in front of the sculpture. How can you look at a painting or sculpture and know that it was made during the period that we call the Baroque? How do you recognize the Baroque style? Let's start by looking at this very important sculpture by Bernini of the biblical story of David who defeats the giant Goliath. I'm standing in front of the sculpture and I want to duck. This man is about <laughs> to launch a rock. He's giving this every ounce of energy he's got. Look at his eyebrows, the way they're knit together. Look at the way that he's biting his lips. The artist is observing the human body, understands all of the natural naturalistic lessons that had been gained during the Renaissance, but is putting them towards an intense emotionalism. This is a position of the body that could only be like this for a split second. The body itself has broken with the stability that had been so characteristic of the Renaissance. Bernini's body is wound up and is about to release its energy. He's like a spring that's taut. And you're right, his body could never hold this position for more than a moment. We see a diagonal. And it's not just straight 
arcade diagonals. These are interrelated arcing diagonals. And so there is this tremendous energy that's not only the result of the representation of his body, but it's the very forms and lines that the artist is creating in stone. And that's part of the way that the figure involves us. It moves into our space. With Michelangelo's David, we maintain a polite distance. Its ideal beauty is there for us to contemplate. But Baroque art does something different. Instead of appealing to our minds, it appeals to our bodies. It appeals to our emotions. Michelangelo's David looks like a god. Well, Michelangelo is largely unwilling to sacrifice the pure linear qualities of his figure. Notice the way in which the line of his body is almost unobstructed, whereas Bernini is absolutely willing to cross his body with his arms, with all of those diagonals that energize, but also move away from that notion of the ideal. There's another important aspect that the complexity of Bernini's composition enables, and that is a greater set of contrasts between light and dark. Michelangelo's David, because he is so planar, the marble is all available to the light, and so you don't get deep shadow. With Bernini, because the form is crossing itself, you get these contrasts between highlights and shadows that further activate the sculpture. So how do we see this in painting? One of the great examples is to look at the Italian Baroque painter Caravaggio. This is an amazing painting and incredibly powerful, very much like Bernini's David. We are confronted with something very close to us. Here is St. Peter who asked to be crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to die the way that Christ had died. So here we see Peter nailed to the cross. The bottom of the cross almost feels like it's so close that we could touch it. So the same way that Bernini's David moved into our space, Caravaggio is using foreshortening. But it also creates an incredible sense of instability. Look at the way that that cross is just being raised up, and we're not sure that the massiveness of Peter and of the lumber is too heavy. Whether or not he may fall with a giant thud, that everything feels contingent and in motion. And here we have the diagonal of the cross, but also another diagonal formed by the back of the figure who's helping to raise the cross, and the figure underneath who's raising it with his back. And so we have crisscrossing diagonals diagonals, which is also a very common feature of Baroque art. It's interesting to compare this to the Bernini sculpture because Bernini was working in the round. Here, the artist is creating an illusion of form, of mass, and one of the ways he's able to do that is to create these sharp contrasts between light and shadow, which, just like the Bernini sculpture, is creating a sense of vividness and energy. So we've got this dark background and these brilliantly highlighted figures, creating the sense of veracity that we could reach out and touch them. The whole thing about Renaissance painting was there was an illusion of space, there was architecture, there was landscape behind the figures. But here Caravaggio gives us darkness and everything is pushed to the foreground. So it's emotional, it's intimate, it feels real, it feels immediate. And it gets to us in our bodies. Look at how close Peter's feet are, and we can see the nails that have been driven through his feet. We can see the nails in his hand. There's an interest in making us emotionally involved, even in the violence here. I'm interested in the way that the center of gravity has been shifted and is being raised up so that there is this instability. A way to drive this point home is just to compare this to a painting by Raphael from the High Renaissance where we have an emphasis on stability and balance. The figures in this painting by Raphael are in the shape of a pyramid, which is the most stable of forms. There's a clear light on the figures. They're situated within this three-dimensional space. We can move from foreground to middle ground to deep background. And Raphael is enjoying the opportunity to give us as much information as he can, not only about the three figures in the foreground, but about the natural world beyond them. Whereas Caravaggio is being much more careful about what we're going to focus on. Look at that beautiful face of the Madonna. She's not a particular person. She is the divine mother of God. But Peter is an actual individual that we're seeing. This is a particular man at a particular point in his life. And there's dirt and clothes that are disheveled. And this is much more of the real world than we ever see in the High Renaissance. So all of the art that we've looked at has been Italian. Can we see these same characteristics in art that's being produced north of the Alps? We can certainly see it in the art of Rubens. If we looked at Rubens' raising of the cross, we would see a diagonal. 
we would see chromatic contrasts of light and dark. What if we were looking at artists who lived in a Protestant context? A lot of the characteristics we've been describing, these are characteristics that we associate with Catholic Baroque art that sought to energize believers. In Holland, we're looking at paintings that are very different than the altarpieces from Catholic Europe, and that's because we're in a Protestant country where artists are no longer commissioned to paint altarpieces for the church. So let's take something that seems like the opposite of the Baroque art we've been talking about. Let's take Vermeer's Woman with a Water Pitcher. Instead of seeing a biblical scene, we're seeing a common domestic scene, a wealthy woman in her home in the north of Europe. So what makes this Baroque? Everything in this painting is quiet. The light has a subtlety to it that is very different from the drama and violence of the light that we saw in Caravaggio. Instead, the artist seems to be in love with the very subtle modulation of light, the very subtle gradations of tone. Look especially at the way that the light filters through her headdress. Or under her right arm as she opens that window. We see a woman surrounded by rectilinear forms. The rectangle of the window of the map on the upper right, the rectangle of the table to the lower right. She inhabits that space between, but she's moving and resisting the stability and geometry that is set up by the environment around her. She's picking up or putting down the picture, opening the window, this caught moment in between. And even the light has a sense of being in between, of the light coming in from the outside, of the light in the interior. And that interest in light is key to Baroque art, whether it's Caravaggio's drama or the subtlety of light in Vermeer. This is a painting that is about subtle transition, and whether or not it's the subtle transition of the light or the subtle transition of her attention from the basin and pitcher to the window. We are close to her. We feel as though we could reach out and feel that rug that covers the table. So that closeness that we saw in Caravaggio and Bernini is still here. Let's move through all of these different types of paintings. How do we recognize the Baroque in 17th century Dutch landscape? Here's Roysdale's beautiful painting of the bleaching grounds. But notice it's not an ideal landscape. This is the landscape of Roysdale's hometown of Harlem. We call this a landscape, but this is really about those clouds. And look at those huge voluminous forms that are moving across that sky. I can see them forming and unforming before my very eyes. This is still about transition. And look at the way that those clouds cast shadows that create these alternating fields across the land below. So Baroque art is about time. It's about effects of light, whether that's dramatic or more subtle. It's about involving the viewer, of moving into our space, of breaking down the barrier between us and the work of art. It's about the use of the diagonal, of a sense of energy and drama, sometimes subtle drama, but still drama. And for me, it's always about a sense of direct relationship with the subject. All right, guys, with any time you have left, you can prep your notebook, work on your homework, and I'll see you tomorrow.